Ladies and gentlemen. Good morning again. Are you all enjoying it? Yeah. How many is this now? Is this the third one? Yeah. Great stuff. Excellent. Okay. Sorry for uh, jumping in right at the very start of this one. Um, there was a bit of a, a problem at the AGM where somebody couldn't be a, couldn't manage to get there. So uh, this is a delayed presentation to Noel. Um, this is the Keith Norman Keith Adams Prize awarded for the most original article published in Radcon in 2017. And I, in my hand here, I have a huge plaque <laughs> <laughs> and a book voucher from the RSGB. <laughs> and this goes to Noel Matthews, G8, GTZ, for the Portsdown Digital ATV Transmitter. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so we can spend Thank the you. Money on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I didn't notice of that question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Right, if you'd uh, slowly s yourself down to a few seats. Um, Good morning again for those of you that are uh, first time in the VHF and UP theme. The uh, instructions I have to read out are, is if the fire alarms go off, please leave by the exits there and there and go down the stairs and assemble out of the car park. Um, no recording of the lectures is allowed, either video or audio, except the official recording, which will go to make up an RSGB video for it will be available to members. Please switch off your mobile phones or turn them to silent. Um, I won't say, that, don't forget to purchase the Expedition raffle funds because you don't pay for VHF Expeditions. <laughs> um, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce Noel Matthews, GTZ. Noel and I have been working together to publicize amateur television and reduced am uh, bandwidth amateur television, which has had quite a considerable in impact with Ofcom over the last few years. But Noel's not here with a TV hat on today. He's to talk, going to talk <laughs> about a level of technical innovation and some real clever stuff with the Farnham SDR project. So, Noel, off you go, take it away. Thank you very much, John. And uh, good morning, everybody. As uh, I said to somebody at the back uh, a few minutes ago, this is uh, out of my comfort zone. I haven't really talked about this for uh, a while. Um, and as John said, normally I'm here talking about uh, reduced bandwidth amateur television. But uh, clearly we've exhausted that one. So this year I'm going to talk about a, a project which we did, or we, are, we started four or five years ago. Um, and it's a web SDR project. Uh, based at Farnham in Surrey. Uh, it's run by three of us, uh, Martin, G8, JNJ, myself, and Phil, M0DMY, who's actually uh, with the BATC team in the uh, AMSAT uh, stream. Uh, Martin is the aerial guru, and I'll talk more about the antennas we're using. Phil is the, um, the, the network whiz, and I'm just sort of glue it together and generally encourage and poke and say, wouldn't this be a good idea? So what is it? Well, it's a, a system of, of receivers that we've put together which are available on the web. And the reason why we think this is, this is interesting is because it's usable by anybody with a standard web browser. So that means the, the barrier of entry or it's very accessible to anybody who uses the web. And one of the things we've seen is that it's introduced a lot of people to radio. We get a lot of people on there who've, who haven't got amateur radio call signs but are very interested in what's going on. You can generally tell who the newbies are because they ask what the funny tones on the GB3 VHF are. Um, interesting, it will decode all modes and you can have many users. Uh, I think the most we've had on Farnham is about 60 concurrent users. And it runs some software developed by a Dutch academic uh, 
who runs a website called websdr.org. And on that website, there is a list of about 150 systems around the world, most of which cover HF, but uh, one or two of them, including ourselves, and also there's a web SDR up at Hack Green. So a lot of the user interface and that is identical because we use the same core software. But the uh, area where it differs is in what we do, what receivers we put on there. So where is it? It's uh, based near Farnham in Surrey, um, sort of uh, between in the triangle of Basingstoke, Farnborough and Farnham. Uh, fairly close to Guildford and about uh, 20 miles from the M25. <coughs> and those of you who know the Farnham beacons and repeaters, we're, uh, we're about half a mile away down the road uh, from the uh, GB3FX uh, group. And Italy Oscar 91 Oscar Fox. And interestingly, the, the site where it is is quite interesting because it's on an old wooden tower which was formerly part of uh, the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. And we understand that the site was a development site where they tested air-to-ground communications. <coughs> and it has still got all of the RACL arrays on it, VHF and UHF. And we understand this is the site that was used to uh, certify the use of the Raykel antennas for air-to-ground um, uh, reception. So it is an interesting site. It's got good takeoff to the east, and that's the view taken with a, a reasonable camera from the top, and you can see the London skyline, which is about 30 miles away to the east. So it goes particularly well to the east. And we share the site with... Oh, the one mention of amateur television. We, uh, we, uh, mention, we share the site with GB3HV, the ATV repeater. <coughs> um, a couple of PMR users. The uh, long collinear there is a 160 digital system. And we've also got a, an ADSB receiver, which we put up there, which contributes into Flight 24. And I think we are one of the highest, hitter, highest hitting UK sites because, because clearly we can see over Heathrow and all of the incoming approaches. So uh, it is a good site, there's no, uh, there's no doubt about it. So why a web SDR? Well, like all things for us, it started as a bit of a technical challenge. The RTL SDR dongles, you know, the, the five, 10 pound dongles you can buy off eBay, which were designed for DVB-T, um, came on the market probably five, six, seven years ago. And we thought that would be a rather cool challenge to see what we could do with these. Um, the other argument is that it, it gives access to what is a superb VHF site using just a PC or a smartphone. And I mentioned it earlier, but it is a great introduction to the, the hobby of radio. The number of people who we get on there, as I say, who are uh, new newbies, and they come in and they hear what goes on, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But we also cover broadcast bands as well as amateur bands. So it gives people a, a flavour of, you know, what you can do with radio as a hobby. And so if you've got anybody who's half interested in doing something, it's useful to point them to the uh, web SDR where they can listen without any additional equipment. It's also a very useful test and monitor remote receiver, particularly on some of the obscure bands, 132 and 472 kilohertz, and also 10 gigahertz. I know certainly uh, there are certain members of the audience who run 10 gigahertz beacons, and they use it to make sure their beacon's still on the air. Isn't that right, Dennis? <laughs> so it is. it really is a, a useful facility, and you can also use it, obviously, to optimise your antennas and optimise your transmitters on those bands. And I understand the guys on the low ELF bands, uh, it is a really useful facility. <coughs> I find it quite, a, 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 quite an interesting thing. The 10 gigahertz, uh, in particular, is really interesting to, as an indication for when there's rain scatter or, or uh, tropo. 
and it's amazing what we've seen on there. We use a, a standard slotted waveguide antenna on 10 gigahertz. And we've seen, I think the best DX certainly I've seen on there was an HB9 beacon. So it's, it's a good indication to, uh, to see what's happening on the bands. You sound just like G4BAO. <laughs> um, so it is different. Um, most web SDRs cover HF and VHF. Um, and the ones that use sound cards obviously only have 96 kilohertz band coverage, which is good for HF, but no good for VHF and UHF. And one of the challenges, you know, when, you, when you're trying to do VHF or UHF, which segment do you, do you cover if you're limited in bandwidth? And this, this was put on before the days of the more recent generations of SDR, where you can cover 10 megs or whatever. And this, of course, was put on using, as a technical challenge, really, to use the cheap RTL dongles. So um, we actually run eight of them at the moment, and that's soon to be 10. And they're great, but they need to be used with great care. Anybody who has put one of these on a, an aerial, a large aerial, will understand you know, the problems. A, the dynamic range, they're only 8-bit. The dynamic range is not particularly good. And also, the, they generate their own noise as well, which we've done some, uh, a lot of work on, particularly on the USB thread. And so, a lot of work, it isn't just a case of plugging them in and using them. And one of the other points we had when we, when we first ran, started to run multiple ones, um, we had to find the right machine whose USB capabilities were up to it. Not so much for bandwidth, but more for addressing. And we'd, we'd end up, all of a sudden, 10 gigs would swap with 137 uh, kilohertz. And, and until we found the right, the right uh, motherboard to run, we had USB addressing problems. So, the eight current bands are 10 kilohertz to 2 megahertz, which gives us the uh, three amateur bands. 50 to 52, which gives us six meters. Um, hopefully by Christmas, we will have 70 to 72 megs on there. 143 to 145, which gives us graphs, radar, and the bottom end of two meters. Um, and 145 to 147 to complete two meters. Uh, 70 SEMs, we've got three to cover the whole spectrum. And at 10 gigahertz, we do 10368 to 10370, which includes the narrow band and the beacon segment. And I'll talk about it in a minute. And the reason why there's some hardware on the table, we're going to do uh, 24 gigs as well. So Martin JNJ really is um, the technical whiz behind a lot of this. And he's done significant work to reduce the internal spurry iron noise with the RTL dongle. Um, and what, after doing some modifications, we also found that putting screens actually inside the dongles reduced the noise significantly. Um, the way we housed certainly the initial five was inside a die cast metal box with some very expensive uh, shielded USB sockets. <laughs> Unfortunately, because you know the way you know the box is never big enough when you build a project. Well, that's exactly what's happened here. So that, that's the first five. We've now got two more. Well, actually three more, which are sitting outside the box. <coughs> Martin also did the work to do direct sampling um, on the RTL dongle to uh, enable us to cover DC to two megahertz. And there'll be some web references uh, the way through. And if you're interested in more of what Martin did on the RTL dongle, uh, take a look at the, uh, his website. Um, so if I now want to run up the bands and say what antennas we use. So for LF, which in our terms is DC to 2 megahertz, it's a, an active, an, uh, active antenna, an E-probe, uh, designed by Chris, Chris Trask 
which uh, Martin has uh, modified slightly. Uh, the interesting thing is it's uh, about a, a foot tall. It's not at all, uh, for even for those frequencies, it's uh, got no length at all. Um, and it's got a complementary push-pull amplifier. Uh, act it's an active antenna, actually, in the antenna. And as I say, uh, g8jnj.net is where you'll find the information on that. There's a whole page on uh, active antennas. So that's, um, that's uh, almost DC, or 10 kilohertz. The actual antenna would work up to about 30 megahertz, but we're, we're only receiving up to 2 megahertz. For uh, 50 megahertz, uh, Martin designed basically what is a hoop and a stub antenna. Because one of the things we wanted to do as well is give horizontal and vertical coverage. Because you can guarantee if we, if we put up a dipole, somebody would want to do, that wouldn't give us narrowband. But if we put up a halo, that wouldn't give us the FM channel. So on all bands, we've tried to give coverage for horizontal and vertical. And uh, this, is, this is the actual unit on the side of the tower. Um, and it's basically um, a hoop and a stub. The, uh, the hoop obviously gives the horizontal coverage and the stub gives, uh, gives the vertical. And he's, he's looked at the gains and the vertical is slightly down. Uh, the, the, it's a relative graph, the numbers aren't absolute. So uh, it just shows that the gain is, is pretty much uh, is, is true between horizontal and vertical. There again, uh, g8jnj.net will give you the uh, will give you the full full gen on that. And 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 for 70 megahertz, we're currently building another one of these scaled to 70 megahertz. Uh, the VHF and UHF antennas, as I say, he we we wanted to cover horizontal and vertical. And so Martin did some work on a, on a design which was actually published in 1939 by W8JK uh, with, a, with a, a, a stretched three-turn helix. And what we've done there is we've, he's optimized, or we optimized the gain towards the, towards the horizon for obvious reasons, but also because one of the other applications we wanted to do was provide an antenna for satellites and also the balloon flights, uh, Phil M0DMY is uh, quite involved with the uh, HAB balloon flight uh, uh, community and we wanted to be able to track the balloons. So we knew also needed some coverage towards the sky. And that's it in bare form. Um, we've then used standard plumbing from B&Q to actually give some mechanical strength to it. So on the tower, that's what they look like. That's the, uh, the 77 one over there with the field plot. And this is the uh, two meter one. We, we, we found it uh, because it's, this is all plastic as well. The whole thing's done in plastic. We found we had to put some uh, stays on the top because it tended to droop slightly. But um, the, great, the great thing about working on a wooden tower is if you want to mount an antenna, you just get your your posi drive screwdriver out and just put a wood screw in. It's, uh, it's amazing. And of course, we can mount antennas on the side of the tower, particularly at the lower frequencies, and not see any, uh, any directivity problems. So that's the VHF and the, uh, the UHF antennas. As you can see, they're not quite at the top, but uh, they seem to work uh, quite well. Uh, for 10 gigs, um, it's a slotted waveguide, standard, standard slotted waveguide. Um, and then a G3PHO transition uh, using the standard plumbing uh, kit from, it goes from waveguide to circular because the actual receiver uses one of the octagon LNBs, um, which are available on eBay for 15 pounds. And so um, they're in themselves, they're quite stable. Um, certainly short term, they're not too bad. Um, but long term, what we found was because this is up at the mast, this is at the top of the mast in a, in a, in a drain pipe, um, 
we, we had temperature drift problems um, during the day as the sun came round and heated it up, it drifted. So actually, we, it's one of the older octagons with the 27 meg crystal, so we locked it, so it's now locked to GPS. So uh, we can tell if Dennis's beacons are drifting off frequency as well. Um, and that uh, that worked surprisingly well. I think I think I was I, w I was surprised just exactly how well that worked. So because we're using um, the RTL SDR dongle, the fact that the IF comes out at I think it's around 270 megs doesn't matter. We can we can just tune to it on the RTL. So you know for less than 25 pounds we've got a, a stable 10 gigahertz uh, receive system. So how does this all come together in, in the shack? Um, I'll talk a bit more about the, uh, it's, it's a Linux PC, the uh, web SDR program uh, or, or application runs on Linux. The, uh, the gray box is the, uh, the big die cast box that we built for the uh, initial dongles. And if I run from the top down, you'll see this is the uh, DC to two, two megahertz. So that's the active antenna with a DC inserter. Uh, at 50 megahertz, there's a six meter preamp and bandpass filter at masthead, so DC again. Uh, and then uh, the three centimeter LMB, so the LMB is up the top. And actually looking at this, we feed down 618 megs into an RTL. So that's how that works. On if you remember, we had three dongles to cover 70 centimetres because we needed to cover six megs. So 70 centimetre preamp down, and then we split that into three dongles. This yellow block here is something I'll talk about in a minute, but you saw on the map we're only half a mile from Farnham, and unfortunately there's a 70 sem repeater on Farnham, which... Um, gives us a bit of stick. We've actually got a, a, a big notch filter to take out Farnham, but it's still, it's still pretty, uh, pretty large. So uh, we do have a little bit of trouble there. And then for the 143 and 145 megs, that's just uh, the same sort of architecture again, coming into uh, to a split into two dongles. Um, the actual workstation itself is a quad core 2.6 gig Xeon. Um, it, uh, we've got 12 gigabytes of memory in because we've got 12 gigabytes of memory, but uh, it normally sits at around about one gig. Um, and Phil found that the super, super micro workstation motherboard is the one that uh, cured all of the uh, USB problems we had in the early days. And it's currently got the eight dongles on and we're not suffering any problems at all. And uh, we feel very confident we can go to 10. So that's the architecture and what it does. Um, there's, the, uh, there's the magic uh, URL. And we've got it so the default frequency when you first go to the web page is UE3VHF. So you will instantly hear something. You'll instantly hear the, uh, the JT tones and CW. And as I say, one of the questions we get asked is, well, if other people are using it, does it matter? No, we can support 50 plus people, all tuned to different, all the same frequencies and modes. Um, if you wish, you can log in. There's, a, there's actually a chat window you can log in, but you don't have to. You don't have to be licensed to use it. Um, if you don't log in, your IP address will appear on the band scale. So what this software does is when you tune to a frequency, it will either put your username or your IP address to show that how many people are listening to that particular frequency. Really interesting, whenever the ISS comes over, you know, the number of people listening to the ISS channel is just... Um, what will you hear? Pretty much anything you'd expect to hear on a 90-foot mast on, on top of uh, the hill. And here's the, uh, here's the other question. Why can I hear GB3FN everywhere? Because it's bloody loud. Um, 
the, the RTLS, the R dongles, one of the things they're not particularly good at is dynamic range. We've got a, a Pi 450 filter in as a notch, which gives us about 25 dB notch on Farnham, but it still does tend to get everywhere. So uh, just one of those things. I'm afraid there's nothing much. We, we did actually, when we first put it on, we had a 23 centimetre um, receiver as well. But A, the masthead preamp failed, and B, we were clobbered by GB3FX, which is the 1297050 beacon repeater. And it just basically made it unusable because where everybody wanted to listen to was only about 250 kilohertz down the band for the beacons. So we, we, took, it, we took that off in the end. So... Uh, all of this is documented on on the uh, on the website. There is a, a user guide on the website, but uh, that's the the type of web interface you are you're presented with. The top is the waterfall that you're tuned to. Um, you've got band selection. You can select the bandwidth. You can select the waterfall, how big or how small. It will give you a reasonably accurate signal strength meter. You can record over time you can plot over time signal strengths which gives you a printout something like that um, at the bottom is the user chat window as i say that's entirely optional to use that within the waterfall you tune just by click uh, just by dragging the tuning bar uh, you can zoom you can do change the bandwidth of the waterfall in and out and if you want to, uh, you can change the receiver bandwidth as well. And rather than seeing the waterfall, you can see a spectrum display. All of this is the web SDR software. This is nothing we've done particularly. We, we did the bit behind it. This is, this is standard for, for the web SDR software. So the Hack Green SDR has got exactly the same facilities. And here... On each band, this is so. This is 145, 433, 435, 437, uh, and 10 gigs. We can put labels on to say what's where. So on 10 gigahertz, it says GB3 LEX, uh, SSB calling over there. Uh, this is the two meter 144.8, so it says APRS. So there are labels to give you a guide as a user as to what you may hear. When you, uh, when you choose to tune in. So on each of the individual bands, um, 10 kilohertz to two megahertz, the LF bands, you hear data transmissions, beacons, uh, radio four long wave, which actually seems very popular. We get a lot of, get a lot of expats come and listen to radio four long wave, for the cricket particularly. <laughs> and of course the amateur bands. Uh, 143 to 145, uh, we do see graphs. We do see meteor pings off graphs. Uh, Russian space downlink is just below the edge of the amateur band. And, of course, um, the two-meter amateur band up to 145, you've got the beacons and uh, there's APRS, which is always there's something on there. Um, and, uh, and obviously the narrowband segment. Uh, 145 to 147 gives us uh, all of the FM simplex. Uh, the ISS is up at 145.8 with their digipeter, and some of the uh, the satellites, the fun cubes, are up above 145.8 because that's the uh, space segment at the top end of the band. 70 centimeters, yeah, we've got the uh, we we cover we cover that in. Uh, four chunk, uh, three chunks, and so things like the FM repeaters, we can hear the narrowband, we can hear the beacons, but but also that's where all of the high altitude balloons are, and some satellites, and 10 gigahertz <coughs> um, narrowband. We cover the narrowband mode, the beacons, uh, GB3 SEE at Rygate. Oh. What this? Only when the temperature's below 20 degrees. <laughs> Dennis has got a little bit of a problem at the moment with his beacon. But, uh, and I, I was hoping, I, I thought I'd got a screen grab of uh, what happens when things light up on 10 gigs because 
Uh, about three weeks ago when the tropo was on, it looked like the HF bands. It was amazing, um, the number of beacons we could you could see on there. Uh, just an illustration of when you zoom in, this is, this is re a really good tutorial for anybody who you want to show what what is happening with radio and what modulation is about. Because you can get in really, really close. You can actually, this is, this is JT from GB3 VHF, and you can see the different levels of the tones. Over here, that's, I'm not sure what mode that is. There's a, there's a reason why I'm a G8. And uh, that's, that's obviously um, sideband, yeah. So, but no, for, for a newcomer to the hobby, to be able to just go in and open it out and show what the different modes, why is that thing sounding funny? Well, this is the reason why. So it's a great tutorial, uh, tutorial aid. Uh, I mentioned beacons, just, just out of interest, one day, a couple of years ago, there were five beacons within, within range had been launched, <coughs> 2014 actually, and just to show the type of, um, the type of thing you can receive, and, and they were scattered around, around the country. Satellites get, uh, get a lot of traffic for the ISS, whenever the ISS is on, um, and known to be doing something, they they always uh, it, it gets used a lot. Um, Oscar Oscar Seven, this was obviously somebody finding out what Doppler was. <laughs> and there's uh, Funcube as well. So um, a lot a lot of interesting users uh, uses. So I mentioned earlier. You've got two or three ways to see the signal. So there's the waterfall, which I've shown before. Here's the spectrum. You can run it in spectrum mode. And the, spe the uh, signal strength plot, I think this actually was SEE, because SEE seems to be on 10 gigs. It averages around minus 70 dB. And you can plot over time, up to a couple of hours, um, on a, on a, you, it will give you a graph, and you can download that graph. You can also record anything you're hearing and download the web file. And the reason why I put this in is because it gets a lot of traffic when there's ISS slow scan. And it doesn't decode slow scan, so... Um, but what you do do is you need to run the decode software on your PC at home. You feed the output from your sound card into your decoder, and then that will decode what you hear. Uh, or you can record the file at Farnham, download it, and then decode later. Um, if you're doing any reporting, such as on the HAB balloons or any other band, don't forget, of course, that the receiver location is not Ipswich or wherever. It's an Italy Oscar 9-1 Oscar Fox. So, almost there. What next? Well, uh, I mentioned two new bands, uh, 70 megahertz um, we're going to put on. The antenna will be shared with GB3HV where we're thinking about putting a 71 megahertz digital TV receiver. Uh, the other band is uh, 24 gigs, which is almost ready to go. This is the uh, receive module. This is a, a, an ex-commercial Lynx equipment. This will go at the top of the tower. That's the, uh, the waveguide antenna, which will go on the top of the box, kindly sponsored by the UK Microwave Group. So that's almost ready to go. This will feed, this will feed 270 megahertz down the tower to a standard RTL dongle. The other project we've got involved in is we're pinning, putting up a... I've, I've called it Sister SDR, another SDR at Goonhilly Earth Station, because you may be aware that there is a geostationary satellite going up, hopefully be launched before the end of the year, and that will be 2.4 gigahertz up and 10 gigahertz down. And what we're doing at Goonhilly is we've put up a 1.3 metre dish, and we will run a separate web SDR P2 
purely for the narrowband segment of a sale, so you'll be able to hear absolutely everything that goes on on the 250 kilohertz narrowband segment on a sale. Um, there's also going to be a spectrum monitor for the, there's an eight megahertz TV transponder on here as well, and there will be a spectrum monitor on, on, the, same, uh, on the same system. But there will be a, uh, a full web SDR to listen to the narrowband segment of SL, and we've scaled it for 500 users because we think it's gonna be uh, quite busy. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much it. I think I can I can do a quick demo if you wish, or uh, we could take questions. Do the demo, come on. <laughs> You've got 10 minutes, do the quick demo. You know what demos are like, don't you? And, and while you're doing the demo, I will ask you a question from the user's perspective. Yep. I'm a big user of web SDR and all sorts of other things. However, it doesn't run with all browsers and all versions because I believe you almost have to use H an HTML5 browser now because the Java out updates stop you. I think, I think that's probably, probably reasonable. Um, yeah. So when you log on to one of these, beware, you might have to either change the browser you're using to one that's got HTML5 compatibility or play around yeah. inside Java, and that's not fun. So APRS... It's just pinged, it will come back. We're listening to GB3 VHF. Ah, here we go. So now, if we just zoom in on that. Uh, where are we? Uh, where's it going? Four, four, four. So now you can start to see the tones. Uh, I make the waterfall larger. You can actually see the tones of GB3 VHF. That's the JT segment that it's just done. I think it now will ident in Morse, if I remember rightly. Yeah, there we go. There we go. And you can see the various labels down the bottom of uh, other stuff. You can, uh, basically any beacons that we've heard or we know about, we've labeled along the bottom here. This may not be a very popular move, but if I go up half a meg or a meg, we could end up in the FM band. Let's see if we can embarrass ourselves by finding them. On. There's only birdies there, I'm afraid, No, Looks like it. What a surprise. And what would Ofcom say about this? You want more? You want more spectrum? <laughs> no, we want more expe spectrum to do experimental amateur work, not for more of the same. Yeah. Well, some, some, some repeater keyed up. It did. That one there, yeah. There? Really? What, there? Right, right. Okay, so that's most disappointing, isn't it? It's probably a, a, sorry, a sorry state, but yes, that's the FM segment. Um, so yes, that's probably uh, enough. We'll go back to... Uh, Actually, let's go and have a look at, let's see if the, the temperature is 28, 20 degrees. What right. on earth uh, is that running? All right. I was trying to count the shift. I am. Hold well on. So, uh, 
That's 10 gigahertz. Good. Right. Uh, faded it. Right. Any questions, please? I'll uh, <coughs> come up with the microphone and uh, you can ask. Questions? Hold on a sec. You know you've got the, yep. Oh, you know you've got the signal strength box down mm -hmm. the bottom, which you can record. I always set up my my rig before every contest, give it a blast, and see what the signal strength is. Then rotate the aerial, see if it's, you know, got working yep. properly. Yep. How accurate is that? I mean, I've noticed over the past two or three years, it doesn't vary by more than my signals. Don't vary by more than about two or three dB. Yeah, I, I think it is fairly accurate. And certainly um, SEE, that's exactly the level I would expect to see from uh, from SEE. So I think it is... I wouldn't say it's calibrated. I'm not. We're not claiming that. But relative-wise, I think it's. I think it's fairly accurate. Yeah. And you just leave it alone. It's not sort of adjusted. It's just out of the no. box RTL. No, we it. we have to balance the gains once we. If we put a new band on, we balance the gains and then. Uh, yeah. Actually, you can do okay, it. Thank you. Any other questions? Peter, want to make a noise from Farnham? Ah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Um, yeah. Do you think you're going to suffer problems uh, on the uh, 24 gig gigahertz receiver once uh, the Farnham 24 gigahertz beacon is back on the air? Well, I, I, I talked to the keeper of the Farnham 24 gigahertz beacon and uh, there didn't seem to be um, a time scale for putting it back on was, was a bit elastic. <laughs> <laughs> we would if it went back on, yes, we would. But I think... Uh, with the state of the mast, because they've, they've got problems on the other mast. I doubt if the 24 gigahertz beacon will go on from there for a while. So, uh, yeah. Any other questions? So here's, here's the scatter plot over time of what's going on. Okay. Well, thank you very much for a really okay. enlightening presentation. Um, I must admit to have actually played Good. with this one myself. It's, it's a useful monitor for, for your own signal. It's, um, yeah. And it's really good to see coverages of the band, but also introduction to other people for, to amateur radio yeah. and what happens on I the think amateur band. So, in the usual manner, can we thank Noel for a really great presentation? <laughs> it's, it's now lunchtime, but we start again at, and I haven't got my glasses on, somebody tell me what time it starts again. 13.45, was that? And we'll see you back then.